If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13, and read with me. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply, from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They all stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Week two of our new series, Refined by Fire. We're going through the books of First and Second Peter. Um, and today we're going to jump right in. Week two, our theme is a new family identity. So we're going to be going through that passage that Pastor Clint read just beforehand um, from verse 13 in chapter one to verse 10 in chapter two. You know, identity is a really huge topic today. It's a huge topic, a huge concept. And when you take the time to really study out identity and what it's all about, you can always see that there are two components to it. There's always this label component, and then there's also a lifestyle component to it. So always these two aspects. Now, the label part comes easy. Like anybody can just identify 
with X, Y, or Z. You can claim to be X, Y, or Z to pretty much write anything. Uh, you can say that you wear that label, but matching your lifestyle to fit the label takes a certain amount of commitment. It takes a certain amount of follow through. Um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing nowadays is that, you know, young people in schools will very quickly latch on to all kinds of identities. You know, I hear sometimes that, you know, kids as young as grade six are saying things like, well, I'm bisexual. Well, you know, they can take that label, but, you know, it may be a different thing to actually live out that lifestyle. And many of the kids who will say these kinds of things are not actually living out those lifestyles. If you're really an environmentalist, you have to act on the things that you say that you care about. If you're really a vegan, then you have to give up eating all animal products, right? Like this is what it means. You have the label, but then you also have the lifestyle. And there are lots of identities to choose from today. If you haven't been paying attention, there are a lot of different identities that you can latch onto, that you can take that label and put it on and say, this is who I am. But Peter is going to show us today a much greater identity that we can live out of. It's the greatest identity that you can have, and it is that of being in Christ, a follower of Christ, part of his family. And just like other identities, there are certain expectations that are connected with the label, right? There's a certain lifestyle that is expected when you wear that label. So we're going to jump right in here. First of all, Peter talks about a call to holiness. So let's kind of review that starting at verse 13. Back up one page. It says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Let's just stop there for now. Now, he starts this passage by using the word therefore, and right, all students learn when you see the word therefore in scripture, you have to look and see what it's there for, because it's connecting a thought that you had already been talking about, and now you need to get that thought in your head before you continue to make sense of what he's saying. So, therefore, relates to what we talked about last week. Because your salvation is precious, that's what we talked about last week, this amazing salvation that the angels even want to look down into. Because you have this amazing salvation, and because it takes suffering to persevere until you fully realize that salvation, because of those things, now, he says, set your hope on the grace that Christ will bring when he returns. So connect those thoughts. And he uses that idea, set your hope, and he says, fully, hope. And it's interesting. Not half hope, but full hope is what he's talking about here. Peter says that hope is actually what gives us this staying power to arrive at the place where we fully realize this salvation that we've been given from Christ. Let me ask you this. What does it look like when a person fully hopes compared to when they just sort of half hope or partially hope? Can you get an image of that in your mind? What does it look like? When I think of someone who fully hopes, I think maybe of like kids at Christmas time, you know? They're like, I can't wait for tomorrow, right? Maybe someone tipped them off about something that Santa's bringing them, right? But they're like all in. They're excited. They have this positive energy. When you see someone who's fully hoping, that is the way that they are acting. And I wonder sometimes, are we, la- are we really that way? Is our hope that full about our salvation. It's not a bad analogy since the word grace actually means gift, right? And that's what he's talking about here. And the gift is the full experience of salvation, this inheritance that we talked about last week. Well, notice how Peter says to set our hope, he says, with minds that are alert and fully sober. The wording there is the same as what we see in uh, the book of Ephesians where we're told to, you know, gird up 
our loins. Um, and so there it says, you know, having girded up the loins of your mind and being sober, Peter says here. The picture is of someone back in that time who was wearing a robe, but was trying to walk around or do things and didn't want to be tripping up on the robe. And so they, you know, put the robe up into their belt, right? Girding up their robe into their belt and so that they can be free to walk around and not trip up on things. This is why many translations render this, if they're using like a dynamic equivalency, they will say, prepare your mind for action. Because in doing that, in lifting your robe up and tucking it in, you're preparing yourself for action. And so as it relates to your mind, that's what they're saying, prepare your mind for action. Get rid of anything that might trip up your mind, is what Peter's saying. Now, it's no secret that Satan sidetracks us by attacking our minds. He uses discouragement. He uses fear. He loves fear. He uses distraction. Do you ever do like a self-analysis? What trips up your mind? What is it that Satan uses to get your mind off of what it should be on? What does he use to keep you from living with your inheritance in mind? This is what Peter's talking about, of staying focused, setting your hope fully on this inheritance. What is it that Satan uses to get you distracted from that? Maybe it's your own reputation or your popularity. Maybe you're always like focused on that. You revert back to that quickly. Maybe it's making money. Maybe it's climbing that success ladder, right? Or focusing on happiness and pleasure. These are things that the world chases. They're still natural for us. Even with the spirit of God in us, we still have that old nature that craves those things, which is why Peter warns us in verse 14. He says, as obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires that you used to have when you lived in ignorance, right? As obedient children, do not conform. Peter says that we know too much now to live that way. We've had our eyes open to the truth, to what God is doing in the world, right? We've, we've come to understand what really matters in the world. And so we need to be obedient children and not fall back into those things. Instead, God is calling us to live holy lives. This is the new identity, this new family identity that he's talking about in this passage. Now, when we generally think of the word holy, we, I think, most naturally think about people that are holier than thou. And so we tend to think of people who are perfect or being perfect, that that's what holiness means. And that's really not the most accurate understanding of the word. The most accurate idea is that of being set apart for a specific purpose. Think of like your mom's fine china if you grew up having fine china. That's not really a thing anymore, uh, but back in the 80s, it was still a thing, right? Everybody had like a hutch that had fine china that you never used, right? Except for very, very special company. If that stuff came out, you knew it was like a special guest because it was set aside for a special purpose. Now, purity is part of that set-apartness, but the bigger idea is that you're living on a different level, you're living in a different space, you're living for a different purpose. This is the idea of being holy. It's of seeing yourself as existing in a different category and reserving your time and your energy and your focus for that space that you're in. In verse 17, Peter says, since the God you worship is an impartial judge, live out your time here as foreigners in reverent fear. And the emphasis there in that verse, if you read in Greek, and you can see it here in English as well, the emphasis on the word judge, hence the exhortation at the end of the verse, to have fear. You live in reverent fear because he is a judge. That's the point that that verse is making. Now, progressive Christians today have a real problem with verses like this and with this idea of God being someone to fear. And they will do almost anything to explain away that idea, to make it sound like, well, God, no. God would never want you to fear him. That's not a good concept. But the simple truth is that God, while being our heavenly father and being very loving, is also very awe-inspiring, and he is to be revered. I mean, think about it. He, he created the whole universe with his word, right? He sustains the universe at every moment. He is all-powerful. And so, you know, to fear him seems like uh, it's a pretty reasonable idea. But progressives like to discard of that idea of God so that they can feel better when it's time to disobey God, when they come across something that they don't like that the Bible says. And so, you know, if they can picture a God that really isn't like that, 
then they can kind of feel a little better about themselves when they want to do the things that they want to do. We ought to fear God, guys, when we choose to go against God's will. This is the point. When we choose to disobey. And in this passage, Peter says that we should fear when we choose to live as if the world is our home. Because doing so doesn't make our father happy. He's told us better. We should understand from the life of Christ, the teaching of Christ, and of the teaching of the apostles, that this is not what we're here for. That our world is not Right? We are in this world, but we're not of this world. And so we should be clear on that. And it doesn't make God happy when we live as if we are settling down here. We have been called to be foreigners, as the passage says. We are only sojourning here in a foreign land. So let me ask you this question. Have you embraced your identity as a foreigner in the world? Are you comfortable with that label? This is the label that the Bible is giving you, that God is giving you that you're a foreigner, how does that make you feel? Are you okay with it? Or does it grate you? That you're a sojourner, that you weren't made for this place. You have a a higher citizenship, with much easier citizenship tests, by the way, right? But you have a different place that you're looking forward to. You're just here for a temporary time. You're like on a temporary visa here right now. You have a better place that you're going to. How does that make you feel? You know, it's a great illustration. Someone was telling me about the... uh, prime TV series called 1883, which is a prequel to the show Yellowstone that some of you no doubt have seen. It's become quite popular. It chronicles the trials that the Dutton family ancestors faced when traveling across the American plain, going all the way from Fort Worth, Texas, all the way up to Montana, where they eventually settled. A large group of Germans were traveling with them, and when told at the beginning of the journey by a seasoned captain who was leading the expedition, When told to discard of all their non-essential possessions, including heavy furniture, many of the people, you can imagine, thought, no, I'm not parting with this. These are very precious things to me. I, I want them in the place where I'm moving to. So they hung on to them. They put them in their wagons. They loaded their wagons down with them. And when they got to a river that they needed to cross on their way, the captain discovered that many of them had disobeyed. And he was extremely angry. He got out and berated them. He threatened them. He made them take all that stuff off their wagon, throw it down, and leave it behind as they continued on their journey. They emptied their wagons of furniture. One scene shows them throwing out a a wood stove, which you can imagine was very heavy, cast, cast iron, even a piano. And they thought that he was being very harsh, cruel, in fact, until they arrived at the river And many people actually drowned because their wagons were too heavy as they went to cross this river. And it was a pretty sobering picture, actually, as you watch this. You know, God loves us. He wants the best for us. He wants us to arrive safely at our ultimate destination, this inheritance that Peter's been telling us about. But he's telling us that we need to travel light and not get burdened down by the things of the world. This is not where we're settling down. So it's a great picture. You know, we easily form attachments to physical things, don't we? We really do. In verse 18, Peter says that we need to remember that these perishable things, even nice perishable things, he says like silver and gold, they were not what redeemed us from this sinful heritage that we were a part of and our ancestors were a part of. We don't owe anything to those things, right? To silver, to gold, to any material things. Verse 19, though, says we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. Peter says this spotless Lamb of God was also chosen, chosen before the foundation of the world, in fact, to provide us salvation, this salvation that is now being revealed to us, this salvation that, right, the ancients wondered about and that the angels stare down trying to understand, we now understand. And it's been revealed to us. And Jesus is the one who establishes our faith in God because God raised him from the dead and glorified him. Again, there's the pattern, right? Suffering followed by glory. And so we trust that God is also able to raise us up from the dead like Jesus and also to glorify us someday. Note this, guys. Whenever you're tempted to throw in the faith towel, we all have those moments, right? Remember Jesus. 
He suffered, but God raised him to life and he glorified him. Again, there's the pattern, right? Suffering followed by glorification. And God will do the same for us if we're faithful. This is the pattern. Let's pick it up at verse 22. It says, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, in this short section, Peter is going to argue that if you've really been set apart, if you've really been made holy, then you will act like people who have been set apart, and you will live out of your true identity. We will live differently than those that are living for self, people that are just living to satiate their own ego or satiate their own pleasures. In verse 22, he says, now that you have purified yourselves and have real love for each other, he says, keep going. Keep on loving one another. Keep allowing God to refine you and to take you to different levels of holiness. He says that we've been spiritually reborn through the word of God. It is God's word that declares us righteous, and it's also, remember, it's also God's word, he says, that endures forever. He's making a connection between these two ideas. In fact, if you're underlining your Bible, I I encourage you to do this. Note, verse 23, at the end of that verse, underline word of God, right? And then again in verse 25, underline word of the Lord. He's making a connection between those two ideas, right? Right? God's word declares us righteous, but that is also the word of the Lord that endures forever. And that's an important connection to make. Peter quotes from Isaiah 40 to show us that only God's word lasts forever. And his point is that it's the same word that made us alive in Christ. That should be encouraging to you. That the word that makes you alive in Christ is the word that lasts forever. That when God says that you are his child, that decree cannot be broken. And so note, guys, God's word defines ultimate reality. If you want to embrace reality, live in harmony with God's word. Now, that sounds very simple, but that's a very profound thing. God's word is what defines reality in every sense, right? When the universe wasn't created yet, God spoke. His word created reality. This includes physical reality, right? God's word defines reality, And so you should follow God's word in everything in life, whether it's for what happened in history or whether it's a moral issue that you're questioning, how to live successfully in the world. God's word defines what is true. God's word says that he has given us, believers, life that produces love in us, the love of God. So when Christians live in love, we're living out of God's word. We are embracing reality. Are you connecting these dots, right? If God says that you're his children, that you've been made in his image, and that you are to love like he loves, this is reality. God is defining reality for you. And so you should live out of that reality and you should love people. When we live for things that perish, we are denying our reality. And that's not going to have good results. This is a fact. A Christian who denies his reality will never be satisfied. You won't. You're denying reality. It's like a person that pretends to be something that they're not. That cannot end well because you're living outside of reality. A Christian that keeps living selfishly when he was reborn to experience and share God's love, that's what Peter says here. If you've been reborn, you've been reborn to experience and to share God's love. If you live outside of that, you will never be satisfied. You're going to chase all kinds of things and try to find satisfaction in them. You never will because you're living outside of reality. Our rebirth into the love of God is as sure as the word of God itself. And in verse 25, he says, that is the word that was preached to you. Well, there in chapter 2, picking it up, he uses that word therefore again. Why is he saying therefore? He's saying because we live in a new reality defined by God's word, 
And he go, he's going to go on and say, now act like it. And he's going to give us some specific things to focus on. Act like the person that you are. Let me give you a little kind of graph here that will kind of help you understand this. When you have the truth, right, which is God's word, but when you have the truth and then you live in alignment with that truth, you find satisfaction. When you have the truth and then you're misaligned with it, you always end up in frustration. This is just how life works, living in accordance with the truth. In ch chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Peter tells us how to live in alignment with our true identity. This is what he's going to tell us now. He says, you've taken on this label. I want you now to live this lifestyle, right? Match them up. And so what does he say? He says, first of all, eliminate a number of things. He's going to give us five things here. He says, eliminate malice, right? Malice is the idea of taking pleasure in hurting someone. Don't ever do that. Don't take pleasure in hurting someone. Deceit. Never mislead somebody, right? Hypocrisy. Never pretend to be something that you're not. Envy. Never allow yourself to resent someone for what they have. These are not good. Slander. Never say things to bring a person down. That's a person made in the image of God. Don't do that. These are very practical ways that we can demonstrate that we are children of God, who have the love of God in us. This is how we match up our lifestyle with the label that we carry. So it's very practical stuff. But these are things that show that we've really been reborn by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God gives us the love of God. We wear the label of child of God, but do we live the lifestyle? It's very important. On the more positive side, he's given us five things not to do. He says, on the positive side, crave pure spiritual milk. This means feeding on the word of God. And it brings to mind images of babies, right? Just when you're just starting to grow. You really need to feed on the word of God. This is how we grow up in our salvation. I want to challenge you, if you're a newer believer right? You're someone that's just kind of starting out in your Christian life and in your faith. You should take advantage of every opportunity that you can to feed on God's word. You should be in God's word every day, studying it, learning it. You should take advantage of other venues that will help you come to know what is true. Bible reading groups, renew groups, classes that are being offered, men's and women's get-togethers. We're, we're starting this mentorship thing. Like, find ways to get into God's word and people that can help you grow. It's milk. It's like, it's like a baby not having milk. That's going to be a malnourished baby. That's going to have all kinds of issues. This is how we grow up in our salvation. How else are you going to grow if you do not feed on the truth, on the word of God? God's word defines reality. How are you going to live successfully in the real world if you don't know what reality is. Moses told the Israelites, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus repeated that same teaching when he was tempted by Satan. So Peter says here, if you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, right? He's assuming those that have started on this journey of faith, they've tasted, they've seen that the Lord is good, they've kind of started down this path. He says, eat up, right? Eat more. Now guys, I don't know about you, but I like it when people tell me to eat more. <laughs> That's a good thing. Nowadays, I'm kind of at the age where I have to eat less. That's the message that I'm kind of going with, right? Eat less, slow down, right? But this is, you have full permission here. When it comes to God's word and the truth, you can gorge on this, right? Go crazy. It, this is like one of those buffets. You pay your 10 bucks, right? And you just keep eating, right? As much as you want. Eat them into poverty, right? Like just keep going. Unlike junk food, there's no downside. No downside. Well, look at verses 4 to 8. It's going to talk here about a living stone and a chosen people. He says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. 
Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, and he quotes again, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Now, continuing here on a discussion of our identity, Peter is going to talk about our relationship to Christ, and he's going to use a building metaphor. He calls Jesus the living stone, capital S here. That's a, a judgment call by the translation because he's a, the special living stone. And then we also are going to be described as living stones that connect to this stone. But he calls Jesus the living stone. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing, because when you think back, what did Jesus call Peter? As we're talking about names and labels and name tags, what did he call Peter? The rock, right? Cephas. Petra in Greek, right? And now Peter is calling Jesus the stone. I think that's kind of interesting. I think it's almost a way of Peter kind of giving the glory back to Jesus here, which is kind of cool. But he quotes from Isaiah 28, from Psalm 118, and also Isaiah 8. Write those down if you're taking notes. Isaiah 28, Psalm 118, and Isaiah chapter 8. To show that Jesus was the cornerstone that was prophesied from the Old Testament. Now, if you're not familiar with a cornerstone, a cornerstone is that big kind of stone as you're starting the foundation of a building. It's that large cornerstone that is used from which everything else is sort of built. That's kind of the starting point of the building. And it provides special stability to the structure as you continue to build from there. We have more modern forms of construction today, so it's not something that you always see, but um, sometimes you'll even still see them decoratively in buildings where they'll put them in. It's not really necessary, but they put it there because that was kind of traditionally the way that buildings were built. Some have translated the word as capstone, which is that stone in the middle of an archway, which if you're not familiar with it, just by the way things are angled, it's what holds the whole arch together. Either way, the idea is still the same. All of the other rocks that are put into the building or that are put into the arch depend upon that stone. That is the stone that gives the whole thing stability upon which everything else is founded. And this stone, Peter says, was rejected by humans, meaning the people in general don't choose to build their life on Jesus. He was the rejected stone. They didn't in the time that he was here. We crucified him. People still don't today. They build their lives on all kinds of other things. He's this stone, this amazing stone, but has been rejected by most people. But we do build our lives on this stone. And God chose Jesus to be this cornerstone. And he's precious, the Bible says. God's goal was that we would form a building around this cornerstone. He calls us living stones who are added to this building. And we're not just forming any building. Peter says we're forming a spiritual house. In other words, we're forming a holy temple. This is the kind of language that he's using. Any of his Jewish audience would have understood images from the Old Testament immediately come to their mind when they're hearing stuff like this. It is a spiritual house or a temple where God could be glorified. And so we become this spiritual, non-physical temple as we join to this cornerstone. Do you ever think of the church that way? It's a great metaphor for what we are. We are a spiritual building. All of us, as we come together in community around this one cornerstone, we form a community. Don't think of the building. We always think about buildings. We are a community where the Spirit of God is happy to reside and where we bring praise to God, and where we do acts and sacrifices to bring blessing to God within our community. This is the image that Peter is giving here. So we become this spiritual, non-physical temple. And like I said, he's drawing on images from the tabernacle and the temple, whose, these structures that were always foreshadowing a greater reality. The greater reality, guys, is is us. It's what's happening now. And there's going to be an even greater reality in heaven someday when we get there. There's layers to this. But not only are we to form this spiritual temple, temple where God can be worshipped, but he says we are to perform priestly duties within it. Did you see that in the passage? So speaking of our identity, write this one down. We are a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Now what is he saying here? Well, 
after putting all of these images together from the Old Testament, it seems pretty clear that he is saying, just like priests offered physical sacrifices in the physical temple, now we offer spiritual sacrifices in this spiritual temple, this community of living stones, of believers that are connected to this cornerstone. In the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices through the blood of animals, right? That was the acceptance of the sacrifices was based upon that blood. Today, the acceptance is through Jesus Christ, he says. Because Christ died on the cross for our sins, we have access to God and we can make these sacrifices. What are the sacrifices that we make today? If we're following out these parallels, right? In the Old Testament, they were bringing animals to the priests in the temple that would slaughter these animals as an offering to God. What are we doing today? What are the sacrifices that we make? Well, first and foremost, Peter's already talked about it. He's going to talk about it again. It's living set apart. It's living holy lives. Not conforming to the world, but living differently. Paul talked about this in Romans chapter 12. Look at what he says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this is a fact, guys. Your greatest act of worship is your daily determination to renew your mind, to set yourself apart for God's purposes. This is the greatest act of worship. This is a parallel to the priest making that sacrifice in the temple. Right? Right? and the smoke being a pleasing aroma going up to God, this is the sacrifice that God is looking for from us today as his holy priesthood. This is the sacrifice that we're offering. It's our own lives. It's this focus, this determination to be set apart for his purpose. Now, Peter says that all people fall into two categories, basically. Those who embrace Jesus as the cornerstone and who build their lives around him, or those who reject Jesus him as the cornerstone. That's kind of a simple dichotomy that he's creating, but it's an accurate one. You either accept Christ as the foundation of your life, or you do not. And Peter says that each decision has its own result. So take a look. If you embrace the cornerstone, he says that you will never be put to shame. If you reject the cornerstone, though, he says you'll stumble and you will fall, quoting from the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus quoted the same passage and went a step further about anyone who rejects him as God's cornerstone. Look at what he says. He says, anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So you have two images. One who comes to the stone and is broken upon it. The, the, the sense seems to be voluntarily. Or you have ones that are just rejecting him, but that are crushed by it. And so let's add this here to the chart. Embracing the cornerstone, right? You embrace the cornerstone, you will be broken willfully. It, there is a breaking that comes to being a part of God's family, right? Of being connected to this cornerstone. But if you reject the cornerstone, you will be crushed. The first one is willful. The second one is unwillful. And so this is just, again, this is reality. Peter's defining reality for us. We may not like it. You don't always have to like reality, but that doesn't change the fact that your life is going to be better if you live in accordance with reality. And I know we live in a pluralistic society where it's considered offensive to hold your faith above the beliefs of someone else today. <clears throat> and I agree that we should be kind toward all people, regardless of what they believe. But guys, we need to admit that the Bible describes one almighty creator God who chose to reveal himself in one person whose name is Jesus Christ. And that this person was God's solution for all of humankind for all time. This is reality. He demonstrated his unique, his unique place in history by raising him from the dead. And so a little bit of advice. You want to be on the right side of this cornerstone. Because he is precious, he is unique. There is no other cornerstone like this. There is no other foundation to build your life on than like the one of Christ. 
So in the short term, you know, connecting yourself to this cornerstone named Christ, it can make you a social outcast. It can require a breaking of your pride. Often that's part of the process. But in the long term, here's the good part, in the long term, you'll never be put to shame, right? On the other hand, those who reject him now, they look good now, right? You're with the majority right now. But one day, it says that they will fall and they will be crushed. And that's not my words. That's the words of Jesus himself. They will be crushed. And so, guys, I hope that your identity is part of this spiritual house that Peter talks about. Let's read verses 9 and 10, and then we'll wrap it up. He says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In verse 9, Peter actually rhymes off four different labels of identity. And interestingly enough, every one of them is a term that was also used of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Peter already played off of the images of the Old Testament tabernacle and that of the priests. Now, him using these images for us and these terms for us does not mean that the church supplants Israel or takes away her national blessings. Those promises God made to Israel are still going to happen nationally to Israel as a nation, but it does show how New Testament believers are now picking up the torch that Israel fa fa failed to carry to be the light to the world that God wanted them to be, and that we've been given this very precious responsibility. And so now we, the church, are being called these four things. The first one is a chosen people. Now Israel is God's chosen people, we know that, but now we also, as New Testament believers, are being called his chosen ones. That's a pretty powerful label. The second one, he says, is a royal priesthood. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God had Moses tell the people, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so we know that Israel used to be given that term, a, holy priest, a royal priesthood. Now we are called the royal priesthood because we are the ones performing these holy sacrifices that we talked about earlier, right? In the Old Testament, the priests are making physical sacrifices. We today are making spiritual sacrifices. We're offering our own lives. We're doing acts of goodness and kindness. We're offering these to God as his priests today. We are a royal priesthood. The third term, he says, is a holy nation. This is the other term that we see there in Exodus 19, verse 6. A nation is a group of people. The word in Greek is ethnos, right? Where we get our word ethnic from. We are our own kind of ethnicity, if you think of it in that way. We are a nation, a holy nation, meaning we are a nation that are set apart for God, for a special purpose. We are identified not by our geography, not by our skin color, but by our set-apartness for Christ. That is what defines our nation, right? We talk about leaf nations sometimes, right? These are the people that paint blue on their face and cry after they... Give up a goal with one minute and 16 seconds left last night, right? Could have beat the Bruins, right? Leaf Nation. We are Christ Nation, right? We identify with Christ. And we're set apart for his purposes. The last one there is God's special possession. Now, literally here, it's a people for possession is what it says in Greek. And the assumption is it's for God's possession. A people for God's possession. In Isaiah 49, 16, Yahweh told Israel that he had actually engraved their names on the palm of his hands. Right? They were God's special possession, the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Now the same is true of us. You ever think about that? God has engraved your name in his hands. It's kind of romantic when someone gets a tattoo with your name, right? Right? God has engraved your name in his hands. You are his special possession. And we as the church together are his special nation and building and possession. These are some very powerful labels that are being used here. And because they're spoken by God, they constitute reality. And it is now our job to make these labels our lifestyle. You seeing what we're talking about? You get the label. He gives you the label now, what are you going to do with your lifestyle? 
And why has he made us all of these things? Look at verse 9, the second half of the verse. He says that he did all of this that we may declare his praises. The purpose here is for all of the glory to go back to God. Now, it's important to understand that God's not an egomaniac, right? He doesn't need our praise. He accepts it because it is fitting and it is based on truth. Right? It's kind of like as a parent, if your little child gives you something for Christmas, right? And you actually, sometimes I think it's good for parents to say, yeah, you should, you should give me, you should give your mother something for Christmas. Why is that a good thing? Well, it's good because you're their parents and they should show some recognition of that fact, right? And do something. Now, they may just give you some little tiny thing that you don't need, right? You're not doing that as a parent because you need something from that kid. You're doing it because it's fitting. It's good for them to learn to do that. And it's the same thing with God. And so he tells us, we do these things, all the glory goes back to him. Like I said, he accepts it because it's fitting. It is based on truth, right? It's based on reality. God is way bigger than us. He deserves all of the praise and glory. And when we act in keeping with what's true, life goes better for us. And so we give him the praise. He ends this section with verse 10. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And he ends this section of talking about this new family identity that we've been given. Guys, I started this message by talking about how labels are a big deal in our society today. And I just want to tell you, you have to be aware of this. Satan is working really hard to get everybody to wear a label, an inferior label. And yet he doesn't even care which one it is that you latch on to. He wants you to put this on. You can write whatever you want on that label, right? As long as you wear it. He'll get you to latch on to whatever, right? Things based on your social standing, your race, your nationality, your ability, your gender, your sexuality. The list goes on. He doesn't care. He'll have you fill in anything on that and make that your identity because it's an inferior identity. It's not to say that there's nothing to any of those things, but they're inferior identities. They're not the identity that we've been called to focus on. And if Satan can succeed at that, you will spend all of your life trying to fit into that label. And this is what a lot of people do. I want to challenge you. Start living out of your God-given labels. We've been given a number of wonderful labels here today. Start living out of them. Make them your lifestyle. Recognize that you've been set apart for God's special purposes. Remember that you are his special possession. I love what Rick Warren, the famous pastor, said one time. He says, I am not who you say I am. I'm not even who I say I am. I am who God says that I am. What a great statement. God is the one who defines reality. And when you live out of that reality, life isn't any easier, but you will find true satisfaction. And when you fail to live out of that reality, you only find frustration. Like we graphed earlier. You're only going to find frustration when you live outside of reality. What does it look like to live out of my identity in Christ? Well, it's a daily determination to renew my mind and to set myself apart for God's purposes. It's my greatest act of worship. Now, maybe you're still disconnected from Christ. And as we wrap things up here today, maybe you're still in that condition. Maybe you have not connected yourself to that cornerstone. You have not gotten to the place where you have broken, right? And connected yourself to that cornerstone. Remember, all of these blessings that we've talked about, they're all contingent upon you doing that. If you connect with him, it may be humbling. It may make your life harder in the short term. But the promise that you get is that you will never be put to shame. And I can tell you guys, I would rather be refined, as painful as that may be, I'd rather be refined than crushed, wouldn't you? I would. Refining, you know what? It's pain with a purpose. And when your pain has a purpose, like we talked about last week, you can make it through a lot. So stop worrying about being on the right side of history. This is what everybody likes to talk about today. Are you on the right side of history? Be on the right side of Jesus, the cornerstone. Peter knew that he was God's unique solution for humankind and down deep, I think that you know it too. And so if you've never accepted him, I encourage you, accept him today. 
Don't delay today. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this truth that Peter has presented to us. There's some amazing stuff revealed here, these amazing labels that God has just graciously given to us. But he calls us then to live out of these labels and to make them our lifestyle. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that are connected to being part of your spiritual family, part of your spiritual building, founded on the cornerstone of Christ himself. We thank you for the testimony that we have from people that have told us through history about Jesus, his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, this confirmation that this one who spoke such amazing things truly was God in human form and who had the authority to tell us what is real and to define reality for us. Lord, help us to submit ourselves to your word, to your reality, and to come to know the blessings of that. It's not necessarily an easier life. It doesn't make us popular. But your word says we'll never be put to shame. And at the end of all things, when all the accounting has been done, we will be happy to have been founded on Christ. So Lord, for anyone here today that's still not there, I pray that they would really just come to admit what is true and that they would be broken upon this rock and made part of this amazing family. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us on Sundays at 4 p.m. for our weekly service at 7755 10th Line North, Mississauga. Or visit renewchurch.ca slash connect for more information about how you can get connected at Renew Church. Mm -hmm.